combat shooting, especially the type that was practiced during World War II by the American forces as well as our allies. This type of shooting took place mostly under poor light conditions and at close quarter range. The handgun has been on the American scene for 150 years. It is becoming increasingly a weapon in which not only do our police have daily recourse to its use, but our citizens also are caught up in a crime wave that necessitates that they carry weapons for personal use and defense. This particular method that I am going to discuss, we are talking about combat shooting as could be learned, practiced, and retained by an individual with a minimum of practice and in a very short period of time. My personal background in shooting goes back to my boyhood. I was fortunate to be raised in an atmosphere where guns were used daily for sport, for hunting, and doubly fortunate in fact that I had as an uncle, Gus Parrott, a very famous exhibition shooter for the Remington and Peters Arms Company. During the early part of my military career, I served as a military police officer and was not exposed to much in the way of combat shooting or even the practice of the regular type of bullseye shooting, which was the vogue at that time and standard for the U.S. Army. At a later date, I was assigned to the OSS and by fortunate circumstance was able to train and work with W.E. Fairburn and E.A. Sykes of the British Army. These men who had been trained and experienced a great deal of post-war combat with handguns the Shanghai Municipal Police Department had been brought back by the British to train the British commandos and other special services during the early part of World War II. Fairburn was assigned to the United States to work with the OSS and Sykes remained in England as chief instructor for the British Commandos and the British SOE or Special Operations Executive, which was responsible for dropping men behind lines and principally the underground operations in German-occupied Europe. Army and American law enforcement indulged in bullseye shooting or training of the various elements of their commands for combat on the streets or elsewhere. Logically, this did not make any sense. And it was Fairburn and Sykes who for the first time transferred the practicality of the street to the actuality of the combat with a handgun and made a successful transition. The U.S. entered the war in 1941. The British had already been in combat for several years. During this period, W.E. Fairburn, in cooperation with his partner E.A. Sykes, produced a small volume 
entitled Shooting to Live. This volume was the first time that the principles of instinctive pointing method of combat shooting had arrived in print. I published Kill or Get Killed and covered the principles of combat shooting using the instinctive pointing method in much greater depth due to the fact that I have been able to not only study under Fairburn Sykes but also was able to develop based on actual combat experience a number of new methods and training techniques in this system. During the initial part of my assignment with the OSS, General Wild Bill Donovan gave me general instructions to the effect that he wanted me to learn all there was in the world to know about close combat, with and without weapons. This meant that I was able to go anywhere, do anything, research any material or ask for any access to material that might be existent, talk to individuals who had experienced combat and with handguns, and generally do a thorough job of research with regard to the combat at close quarters handgun problem. One of the research projects I undertook was to go to Deadwood, South Dakota and do some research on Wild Bill Hickok, the legendary shooter and gunman of our Wild West. In his later years, Hickok became the center of attraction for a number of dime novelists and other people and while he was still alive was made into a hero for the pulp magazine trade in the eastern part of the United States. In the course of my research in the courthouse in Deadwood, South Dakota, where Hickok is buried, I encountered a letter which I thought was pretty indicative of the principle of instinctive pointing combat shooting. Someone had written Wild Bill a letter asking him how he did it. And in this letter, he had written back, and why the letter was on file there, I have no idea. But in the letter that he had replied to the person who had made the original inquiry, he made a very significant statement. He said, I always raised the pistol to the eye level before shooting. Even though I lost maybe a half a second in doing so that was the secret of my success. This stuck with me, but it did not really have a practical application until I encountered the Fairburn psych system a little later on in the, the war. Combat shooting takes place in circumstances that necessitate special consideration being given to the condition of the human body, the 
conditions of light, the mental condition of the shooter, and the physical position of the shooter when firing the weapon. In those cases where the sights are used, it is appropriate to use bullseye targets for such firing. In those cases, and this would be the vast, vast majority, where the sights are not used in practical close combat shooting, the type of a target used should be a silhouette target or some other target simulating the human body. The object is to learn to shoot at a target that is shooting back. In approximately 80% of incidents where the handgun is used by law enforcement in close combat, the conditions are such that the sights will not ordinarily be used either because of lack of time or because of poor light or other conditions that do not enable the shooter to utilize his weapon as he would on the bullseye type target range. Basically, the shooter in, under these conditions shoots by what is known as instinctive pointing. And by instinctive pointing, I mean he raises his gun as you would raise your finger and point. And if you raise your finger and point at any given object, and you look along that finger, you will note that the finger is pointing at the center of mass of the target, and very close to what you would desire to have the hit area. If you transfer this to the handgun, you would substitute the gun barrel for the finger. Note that I say this is the way you shoot by raising the finger and pointing at an object. Normally, the basic position for all combat firing with a handgun at close quarter range is from an instinctive forward crouch. The gun is held at approximately a 45 degree angle and the shooter raises the gun to eye level and fires as soon as the gun reaches the highest point and blocks out the target. The grip on the firearm is a convulsive one and there is no need for extensive training in trigger action. The whole body is tense, the wrist is locked, the elbow is locked, and the pivot for raising the firearm from the carrying level to the eye level is based on a stiff arm pump handle, if you will, procedure in which the hinge joint is the shoulder joint. When a man is in combat or subject to enemy fire, he will instinctively crouch. This is especially true when he is moving forward. No one will have to tell him to assume this crouch when he is being fired upon or expects to be fired upon. In practice, however, he will have to be forced to assume this basic firing position. The crouch, which he assumes should be natural, with the knees flexed and the trunk bent forward, 
aggressively from the hips. The position of the feet must also be natural, and although he will ordinarily pause when actually firing, he must be able to take another step forward in the target direction in a nat natural manner. Positions assumed in practice which are forced and not natural to the individual shooter are undesirable. Many shooters, when firing from a crouch, neglect to put one foot forward in front of the other. And this is known as a straddle trench position. This is unnatural and should be replaced by the natural position of one foot being placed forward on the other so that you can advance as you are firing. During the World War II period, when all military handgun training or soldiers as well as civilian police was based upon shooting bullseyes, it was very necessary for us to give a dramatic example of the differences between the two types of shooting. In our particular case, the scene would be somewhat as follows. The instructor would be on a platform in front of the students, who naturally would be facing the instructor. The instructor would be t discussing firearms, differences between combat shooting and shooting bullseyes. And during the midst of this discussion, we had an officer who in this case was named Butch Thompson, who was six foot six and had a voice like a bull. Butch would kick the back door of the room open, come roaring in, yelling and screaming, and cut loose at the instructor on the platform with six or seven blanks from his 45 model 1911. At this stage of the game, the instructor would carefully put his hand on his hip, take a one-handed assumed stance, raise the gun to his eye level, and squeeze off the trigger. And the obvious differences between reality and target shooting were thus vividly uh, exposed. sights and the target is not shooting back. However, it is equally important that police be taught to shoot with the one-handed instinctive pointing method as there are a great many circumstances when the weaver stance is not applicable to the given combat situation. And generally, the given combat situation occurs at night under very poor light conditions when the use of the sights is of no particular value to the shooter. Another interesting point about the Weaver stance that has recently been discussed at some length amongst police trainers is the fact that the Weaver stance, using the bent elbow, 
is not used even by the most highly trained individuals when the target is shooting back. Instead, the isosceles stance is employed, which again is both arms fully extended uh, toward the target with no bent elbow, no bent elbow press. There are a number of situations in which the so-called weaver stance is not applicable to a police officer in line of duty and many situations occur in which this stance is not one that can be applied to that particular given situation. For instance, the shooter should be able to shoot with one hand and have a flashlight in the other. The shooter should be able to also shoot with one hand using the instinctive pointing method when advancing down an alley using his left hand to feel, feel his way or to maintain balance. Going up or down stairs, the shooter should be able to use his free left hand to maintain balance. Also, the weaver stance does not apply to an officer sitting in the car when he's forced to pull his firearm. There are probably a number of other situations such as when a man is running forward actively with his gun where he would not be able to use the weaver stance, two-handed stance, to hold his gun while running forward for some distance and still maintain his balance. All of these indicate that police should be given instruction in bullseye type shooting or accurate tar target use shooting using the two-handed stance when there is a time, when there is a light, and mostly given instruction for the combat instinctive pointing type of shooting for the other 80% of the time in which this is the situation in which he will find himself when firearms are used. I think the next thing we should do is go out to the range and actually see how the instinctive pointing system works, its advantages, and cover some additional fine points with regard to this system of close combat shooting with a handgun. The principle of instinctive pointing shooting is for the shooter to be in a aggressive forward crouch with his arm extended, his elbow locked, and his wrist locked with a convulsive grip on the gun. He then raises the gun and fires at the time the eye and the gun reach the level between him and the target. All right. You will notice that with the Consulsive grip and the straight arm that and the double tap or double pull of the trigger that the recoil itself gave dispersion to the hitting area. Elbow will be tight, the pivot point will be at the shoulder, the gun will be raised to the eye level so it, the gun is between the eyes and the target point and the wrist uh, of the hand will be loose. This should result in a sequence where the bullets are out of control and very far spread apart. All right, that's okay. Got one down and that's good, one down in the arm and one up there. Huh? With the gun held in the proper 45 degree angle, with the convulsive grip, the tight wrist, and the straight locked elbow, with the pivot, at the shoulder point, the 
group of the weapon when fired twice under combat conditions should be tight enough to enable a headshot. For example, if the target were wearing a bullet resistant vest. Oh, that's all right. It's okay, do it now. All right, let's do it. Let's do it two more times. That's great. Huh? Point towards an object is to raise your finger and then if you sight along the finger you will find that the finger is pointing in close proximity to the aiming point. If you shove your hand forcefully toward the target, this is an unnatural movement and is not the way that people generally for, uh, point towards objects. Any kind of a raised pistol ready position, carrying the pistol in use in combat preparatory to firing is not correct in the raised pistol position. The low ready position is the proper position for always carrying the pistol just preparatory to using it in combat. Aggressively and under poor light conditions and the target appears on your right or left, the body should be pivoted regardless of the foot condition toward the target as the gun is raised to the eye level to shoot. Just get the body around so the shoulders are square facing the target. It is inadvisable while walking forward in a dark alley or under poor light conditions to fire from your, from your right or left without moving your feet and body, huh? That's right, that's okay, that's all right. Advocate that while facing or moving in a forward direct direction and fire comes from the right or left, that the body direction be changed by jumping in a straddle trance position before firing. This is not too satisfactory a method, but probably superior to the arm swinging method. Basically, it is not smooth where the people happen to be walking or doing the firing, and there are all kinds of conditions where this type of, of body changing position causes loss of balance and direction and is not feasible for ordinary street combat conditions. If you have time, if there is sufficient light and you can see the target, the two-handed isosceles position is the best way to, to fire in actual combat with a handgun. The most preferable way to fire is to use the isosceles position, that means with both arms extended, not in the weaver stance, and just preparatory to firing, you shove forward slightly with your right hand that is gripping the pistol and pull to the rear slightly with the left hand that's supporting the pistol. And this, this firms up the sights just at the period when you are pulling the trigger. Most combat at close range in poor light or no light conditions and street conditions wherein the instinctive pointing shooting method is used without the use of sights takes places at it ranges 20 feet or less. The shooter will now shoot at 20 feet a sequence of six shots, two shots each time, and then will move up to 15. shots using the co combat method of shooting without the aid of sights is 15 feet. Street combat ranges under poor light conditions wherein the sights cannot be used generally vary between the 20 and 8 foot mark. The shooter will now fire at 
the eight foot mark and obviously at this stage of the game and at this range his grouping should be closer than at any other time during the various ranges he has been shooting. It is obvious that as the shooter range decreases towards the target, the groupings toward the target center or muzzle mass should be closer together. One other point to remember, under poor light conditions, no sight conditions, and street conditions, that the shooter has a tendency to fire at the muzzle flash of the opponent. If the muzzle flash is oval in shape, that generally means that the opponent or adversary is firing directly at the shooter. If the muzzle flash appears in the form of a streak to left or right, this indicates that he is in a position that is not in a direct angle with the shooter. All right, this time the shooter will be firing at 12 feet, which is probably more of a normal distance and range than most others in this kind of combat. It'll be 12 feet or closer if police statistics are indication of close combat situation where sights are not used. To hit the assailant in the head as well as in the body center where the yellow dot is placed. We are going to ask the shooter to fire 12 shots in sequences of two shots, raising and lowering the gun six times as he advances towards the target. I would like to point out that it is better to move aggressively in towards the target and keep on shooting than to run backwards from the target if it's shooting back at you. You can get hit just as easily running backwards as you can forward. If the adversary sees the shooter that he is opposing, shooting and advancing steadily towards him, this becomes an important psychological effect that is detrimental to his own accuracy. shows the use of the isosceles stance using aim shot at the target at a distance of 50 feet. Remember, in this case, you have time to see the sights, you have time to see the target, and you have time to shoot. And light conditions are correct. The hand is too large or the gun grip is too small. In either case, to shoot in this situation correctly, the V of the hand and the butt of the gun must be in a straight line with the gun and the barrel. This is the way it must be gripped convulsively. 
If the gun is gripped improperly, in this case, due to an enlarged hand and a small gun, the grip would be somewhat like this. This means the gun would shoot to the right, or conversely, over here to the left. So this is why it makes it important that the gun, whatever gun is selected, should fit the hand as much as possible to avoid these extremities. In all probability, most police handguns will contain built-in laser aiming devices that will enable exact shooting in low light conditions so that the bullet impacts wherever the laser points. This will be a revolutionary development in police close quarters handgun combat under normal street low light conditions and will give the policeman a definite superiority over the criminal assailant. Is that shielded? The bullet will impact where the laser points and the best method to bring the gun into play and the fastest method to bring the gun into play to accomplish the emission is to bring it to the eye level via the instinctive pointing method. The full extent of the built-in laser development has yet to be realized, and this is going to create changes in police training programs, at which time it will become evident that the instinctive method point of shooting, such as instructed for normal combat without the laser sights will still be the best method to position the gun so that the laser strikes in the closest area to the target area that is possible prior to the trigger's pull.